Show up. Part way through, it'll be fine. You're just waltz in five minutes yeah. late. Good. Jazz club. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully the room's not full. The brother thought this was like the pedal more. <laughs> 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 there he is. There we go. Yeah, oh, uh, are we doing? Yeah, I think this one. If we're gonna have you. Like <laughs> No, no, there's nothing to clip it to. Here we go. This, this feels like it's about the action. I'm looking forward to seeing it all. I was very impressed to be invited. Because you guys know what you're doing or not. You can talk. We are all flying by the same time. I don't know what I'm doing. This is my first Boston ever. I don't even know. Okay, so you're in this conference. You may think you can do it better than It's probably not the one that was right there. Yeah. Okay. Right, I'm really jealous of Mike's beer. Does anybody else want the beer? Right, yeah, I'm going to go get it. Right, I'm going to get it. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to get it. Did you try to What's that? You said your friends? No, my, uh, his beer. Oh, beer. He's getting the beer. This is not working. Oh, water. 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 Oh, uh, package management for the Go programming language, and I like package management writ large. It's a problem. And I'm Philippe Ombredan. I write tools to detect the origin and license of code. So it's open source and open source, and uh, business-wise, I'm, I'm the CTO of a small startup, which does the same, but also offer professional services for companies. I'm Todd Gamblin. I'm a computer scientist at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. I work on making parallel simulations go fast, and I also maintain a package manager called SPAC. I'm Mike McQuaid. I'm the lead maintainer of Homebrew, and my day job is at GitHub. Uh, the reason why Andrew wasn't able to get me for this was because I, on reflex, submitted this to the, the room I normally submit things to, and then complained about why they'd not accepted my talk, which I'd submitted to the wrong room. <laughs> you could have been accepted anywhere, no? Uh, I think I think the other room would have had to have accepted it or something. Oh, okay. Know. Yeah, if you can accept your own talks at FOSTEM, I think you're going to be talking about it. <laughs> okay, so we'll start off with a nice, light, easy question. Just quick fire, tabs or spaces? For what? I work in Go, I don't have a choice. And I'm happy about it, tabs. I work in Python. I don't have a choice. <laughs> I do actually, but I love spaces <laughs> and and four, please, not two like Google or <laughs> spaces. I work in Ruby, so I would prefer to be using tabs, but I have to use spaces. To <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Very nicely warmed up. <laughs> <laughs> so we're all in agreement, basically. Half the room was mad at half of us, and half the room was mad at the other Which half. Which would you say your favorite element or favorite feature from a package manager, not necessarily one that you've developed yourself, uh, would you like to steal or to see implemented in every other package manager? Are we going this way every time? If you like, if anyone has very strong feelings. Let's switch it up. 
go from that end oh. first this time. Uh, I don't know about feature, <laughs> but I think app gets a really great package manager. Like the UI isn't always incredible, but it's really fast and it generally just does its job well. So I would like to. I, I sometimes dream about just rewriting Homebrew as like a thin layer on top of app get. Um, I like good dependency resolution, so I guess I'd like to see that in all the other package managers. <laughs> I think that's something I haven't implemented in my own yet, but we're working on it. So. Uh, I think I would like to use a single package manager and not, <laughs> not have like 20 to deal with. <laughs> yeah, uh, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> um, uh, so uh, right now I can point to I just found out like three days ago that uh, Dart just implemented unit propagation in their SAT solver. Um, and it uh, apparently, I haven't looked at it yet, but apparently makes for much more followable error messages. And the reverse of that, which feature or attribute of package management would you like to see die in a fire? <laughs> Todd? I'll start. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I have one. So there's one in spec actually that I wrote. Um, so we actually uh, we have a, a package from um, some scientists who are very good at packaging. Don't get me wrong. Um, where they maintain a 40,000 line patch on one of their dependencies, and so we actually implemented the ability in spec to um, have patches on your dependencies, and spec will build you a special version of that library just for you. <laughs> And, and so it's, and it actually gives it a separate hash that's based on the content of the patch. So you can, you can have your own little sandboxed library. So I wish that we did not have to do this. So I hope that that feature dies in the fire because people stop doing this. Let's just drill down on that, Mike, because I know you have some opinions on patching. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I had a lot of other ideas, but then Todd's, that's the worst thing I ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we, we, it's like... <laughs> It, it's like those dedicated injection stations where we're, we're not, you know, they, they do this thing. We yep. want to support them in the community. We want to bring them in, but we can't do it unless we allow them to do this thing that we don't like. Yep. And so we're, we're bringing them in, and, and we hope that we can use this to find the packages that do it and tell them, stop that. I hate patches in general, so that's, that's where I'm coming from. So does anyone here know or remember the Debian OpenSSL patch debacle? Some people. Yeah, some so, people covering their face. <laughs> yeah, no, so, and, and it's, it's one of those things, it's, it's not, no one is to blame for it. It was more a, a infrastructure architectural thing rather than any individual. So basically what happened with, with Debian was they have, like a lot of package managers, they will patch things if they appear to be not working weirdly and then they will try and submit their patches upstream. There was an issue where they would run Valgrind on things and they ran Valgrind on OpenSSL and OpenSSL was reading from memory that wasn't allocated. And this is almost always a very bad idea. So they basically patched that out and submit the patch upstream. Never heard a response back on that. And turns out for a few years that this patch was patching out a source of entropy in OpenSSL, which I don't know how much you know or don't know about encryption, but basically that means that like the encryption was made much worse than it should have been for key generation. So basically any machine using Debian or Ubuntu had to regenerate all of their keys they were using for anything with OpenSSL because they were all predictable effectively. So it was possible for other people knowing stuff about that machine, for example, the date, the time, the input devices, for example, to predict similar keys and then go forward and basically obliterate all the encryption on the machine. And this all happened because someone decided they knew better than the OpenSSL maintainers like how OpenSSL should work and then submitted a patch and then just applied that patch indefinitely for years. So this was one of the things... Sorry, I disagree. You just... Yeah, no, 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 I agree. And to be clear, like, this, this is a mistake I would have made myself. If I was a Debian maintainer, I'm not blaming that maintainer. Yeah, I, I, what I blame is the, the process, not the individual. Like, as I say, I have made similar mistakes like that myself. What, but the problem is the process is that we have a lot of package managers who got, fell in love with patching things that they didn't necessarily understand the consequences of their patches. And as a result, you end up with software which doesn't work how it's meant to work. And that's why I think patching widespread is a bad idea. To be clear, again, I'm not blaming any individual. But maybe it's just uh, symptomatic of the fact that a lot of the various upstream packages you submit a bug or whatever else 
and the guy seemed to be on the holiday for the rest of their lives. Yeah. So if they, if they told you clearly, no, don't patch that because you screw up all the stuff, then presumably this yeah. Debian patch would not have lived so long. But in, in those cases, if people don't respond to your patch yeah. submissions, then you shouldn't be pat you shouldn't be including that software at all. And if, if yeah. it's something <laughs> crucial like OpenSSL, if they're not responding to your patch submissions, then that's a bigger problem. Yeah. Like, and yeah, so, sorry. Okay. Obviously, you got me in my soapbox very early. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> nice segue into the kind of discussion about whether packages and package registries should be created or vetted or approved and where does the onus of responsibility and maintenance exist, or where should it exist? In the case of Sam and Go, it's much more extremely on the user as a responsible person. Not optionally, yeah. yeah. Uh, do you think that, I mean, within Google, that's entirely not even a problem, right? If you're using just uh, an internal registry, so, yeah, so, I mean, for, I don't think that um, uh, the lack of a registry is a problem, like, accountability-wise for Go. Um, I mean, the, there might be some small things. I think there are much bigger problems that we have that arise from not having a registry. Incidentally, we're going to have a registry. Um, that will happen. Uh, there's, like, there's no question about it. It's just, just a question of getting to it. Um, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, like, th things that we can't do, for example, right now, is any sort of... There we go. You went, you went on a quest. Oh, all right. All right. Oh. All right. And did you want one? Look. No, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> Cheers. Sorry, yeah, folks. all of you. So there we go. All right. Uh, okay. I think you forgot a few folks. <laughs> all right. We'll, we'll have beers after. It'll be great. Uh, uh, yeah, nice, nice Boston cup with beer. Um, so yeah, no, the the like things that we can't do, for example, is we can't do like a yank of a version, um, which is a really valuable thing to be able to do. This version's bad. Don't pretend like it never existed by removing it, but instead mark it with some metadata that's bad. That doesn't exist. We can't do that because we don't have anything central like that. We also can't apply literally any kind of filtering um, as to whether or not, like, I mean, you know, do you even have like? valid Go code in there, or does it all just not compile at all? Like, we can't even do the basis level of, of filtering because everything just goes straight back to the original version control source repository. Uh, however, um, yeah, for, I, with language package managers anyway, I don't think there's a lot of value in, um, I'm fine with, with an open universe that has uh, no, um, that has, that has no limitations on who can actually uh, uh, push into it. Um, I think that that's the sort of thing where you should filter outputs, not inputs. Uh, I think I agree with you, but I think on the other end, so say there's a bad Go package or a bad PyPy package. And because there's a few bad apples, every user will have, therefore, to vet and review every bit of code they need to use ahead of time, and they don't have any warning. So the work to actually create of that, if there's no central visibility, ends up being done over and over and over and over again. Uh, take a practical example, um, a package without a license, right? Where license is, whether you're in a commercial setting or a free software setting, is a gating item before being able to do anything with the code. If you don't have a license, and there's nothing that happens to patch upstream, um, no information that there's no license available, every single user that's responsible will have to check. And that's going to happen one time, a thousand times, or 10,000 times until it's fixed. And, and that's where I think uh, some curation or some visibility about data or the lack of data or the lack of creation is important because otherwise we just reinvent and redo the stuff over and over again. So can I clarify the question? Did you mean like you have to be, you know, granted special um, special powers in order to be able to, to publish or were you talking about like <coughs> a level of whatever that means, I guess, in the case of vetting or some way of essentially gatekeeping a 
approved set of packages. So Maven Central, you need to get approval for a namespace before okay. you can publish to that, which means that you can't typo squat on Google, com.google or similar yeah. uh, before Google gets there. But yeah. once that is enabled, then you can publish as much as you like. That potentially stops some issues, but uh, on the flip side, the trade-off, as with everything in package management, the trade-off is that you have to go through Maven Central and talk to another human to be able to publish that thing. Yeah, yeah, no, I would say, I mean, my line is automated verification of code, no anointing of humans. I'm, I'm with you there. I think it's probably more trust and verify than yeah. prohibit publishing at first and, and, and limit the flow. Um, yeah. It's probably more of putting arbitrary barriers if you systematically reject something for whatever factor. Now, being able to alert the user that this is shitty code, this is vulnerable, it has no license, uh, nobody uses it, I think is valuable. But then you do it after the fact, and the user has eventually available the information rather than being stopped as an author to publish anything. Yeah. For us, it's a. <coughs> you said the Maven uh, vets authors before they can access the namespace, uh, and the namespace is based on the domain name, right? Yes, I do. <coughs> what happens if the domain changes the owner? Do they revet everything? Yeah, yeah, it's a terribly that? bad idea anyway. Yeah, <laughs> they should go away. Yeah, a question for any Java people in the room, I guess. Uh, I, I, can, I can give you my opinion there. I think the, 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 the namespace in Maven are a terribly bad idea and should never have existed in the first place. They should go away. Uh, I'm going to ask. Uh, I'm not uh, um, totally sure, but uh, based on the process of approving uh, that I know, uh, Five years ago, there's uh, certainly not not such check because uh, it works uh, in way that you open a uh, issue on some Jira Jira uh, of uh, organization, uh, just write some information about you as of where you want to package uh, your domain name. They will probably manually just assuming from uh, how it works and how long it takes uh, check the domain and the information you enter it and uh, you're in. And uh, I never get any email or something uh, 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 after that. So I, I think that there's no such uh, such check. Interesting. I mean, I'm just going but, on But what? it's still much better than in EM <coughs> or any different uh, page manager. And uh, uh, actually, I heard a lot of complaints about how Megan Central works. And uh, I think that uh, left pad and similar issues uh, 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 show it so that uh, these uh, st uh, strict rules in Megan Central actually make sense. Yeah. And g getting back to your point about tying namespace to a domain name, mm -hmm. that has a lot of issues, obviously. I mean, what if just the domains falls out of registration and there's this implicit relationship that's broken? And I don't think in the case of Maven, they've actually even ever enforced that seriously. Uh, I know package in the ComSun namespace, which are not from Sun, or were never from Sun, and definitely not from Oracle either. <laughs> GNA is one example, Java Native uh, Application Interface, which is a kind of foreign function interface for Java. Excuse me? Yeah, it's a good it's a good library, I think, for, for Java. Yeah, yeah. Next, Mike's just quietly sat here whilst uh, lording it over the homebrew <laughs> registry and deciding whether or not to thumbs up or down <laughs> any package at any point. Do you have any pins on this? Well, I, I would love to hear Todd first. Okay, before I jump. so yes. um, yeah, I, <laughs> for for so we're similar to homebrew in this regard in that. Currently, I mean, SPAC ships with a built-in package repository, and it comes with the, the repo because we don't have a stable package API yet. Um, you know, in, in our stage, we don't provide, we, we approve a lot of things and, and because we're trying to ramp up participation and get more people contributing. And, you know, it, it's hard enough to get HPC people to package anything. And, you know, I think that we're, we're just happy that, that they do. Um, 
I think that you know this question has come up in the context of hey we're going to try to use SPAC to package all the stuff that the U.S. Exascale program is is building and and then that's you know some sort of vetted package repository with with their name on it and so you know at that point um, we're planning on having you know more aggressive build tests for packages um, I, you know I would hope we would do some kind of security testing although I don't know exactly what we can do in in that um, area. But if we did that, then we would probably just separate that out as, you know, that's the vetted repo. And, you know, that's what comes with the thing when you download it. And if you want to have another ecosystem, you can have that on the side. And maybe we even support, like, a bleeding edge ecosystem um, that we help you merge things into. We just don't call it stable or, you know, reliable. Um, so that, that's what I would say. I think it depends on the, the phase of your project. Um, if your project gets big and, you know, the, the life of the project really depends on, um, whether or not things are vetted and whether people can rely on it, um, then I think you do need to start vetting things. If if you're trying to grow, then you know th there's a there's a process that you, that you go through to get to that point. Yeah, I think like Homebrew has gone through that process as well. I think the interesting thing is, I guess you see even on the panel like the difference between language and system package managers, where like if if the end res if what people are uploading to you is effectively what you are delivering to people as well, like you say NPM or RubyGems, you upload the source code effectively and then people download the source code and then it's built on their local machine, then that's fine. Uh, when you start getting to the point where you're, people are, you get, you pull the source code from elsewhere, then you download it, you build something, and then what you deliver to users is normally the artifact of that, like say a binary package or whatever, then things start to get a little bit more complex because then like yeah. what they are giving us, what we're giving to our users is not necessarily what <coughs> like exactly what Upstream has given us and it depends on the compiler flags and the systems we build it on and stuff like that. And in that situation, I think, I mean, other than anything else, we don't want people to be running arbitrary code on our CI machines. Um, it's fine to do so, they're protected from that, but like, you know, we don't just want to allow someone to upload a package with a billion lines of code, which then takes down our CI boxes or whatever, because it takes too long to build. And um, so I think we've, moved over time from the will accept just about anything model to having a curated core and then we used to have kind of more like semi curated like these are official like blessed other repositories but again that model hasn't really worked for us either because people see the homebrew name next to a repository and they think that's official and therefore everything should work just as well and we found it's kind of easier just bringing everything in that we want to into a single repository which we maintain a consistent standard on. And then if people want to do their own thing, then they can go off and do that elsewhere on GitHub, I guess, almost kind of ghost style. Yeah. And But then that's under their name, and there's no expectation that Homebrew itself is to blame if that thing doesn't work. Whereas anything with like, you know, Homebrew, Homebrew Science, Homebrew PHP, Homebrew Nginx, that looks like it's an official Homebrew project, and therefore when it doesn't work, and no one replies to your issue because the particular maintainers we delegated to in that repository aren't responsive, then I think that reflects badly on the whole project. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a tough balance, I think. Okay. So, you all mentioned that uh, there probably should be some form of human involved in the process. Todd posed an interesting question to me earlier about the idea of potentially being able to automate all of package management. Is that even possible? And if it is, should we try to remove humans from the kind of the process? And or is it something that is in like humans have to be involved in this? Well, so uh, w w what are you saying? Is it is it possible to build software automatically? Sure. Will do. Will it do anything useful? Probably not much. <laughs> That's the difficulty. Uh, <clears throat> if you if you think about packages as, as Lego or Mecano, uh, what we as software developers will end up doing is uh, gluing these in a certain pattern together, and that's still a skill. And I. Sure. So, I mean, we try to automate probably a lot more aspects of, of building a package different ways um, than, than other package managers. 
And so I'm, I'm a big fan of trying to expose enough information to do that. Um, that said, like, you know, we, we're not emphasizing stability right now. So, I mean, what, what we want to do is expose all the options and make it so that we could automate things and test enough of the configuration space that we could have a reasonable chance that a tweaked build that someone executes will build and, and run successfully so that they can tune easily and so that you could potentially auto-tune your packages. I think that would be really, really cool. Um, but that said, you know, there is an iterative process to even that, where you have to work with the human to actually get the thing packaged in the first place and expose the parameters. And I don't, I don't know if you can automate that. Maybe for some of the common build systems, I mean, you could probably learn that stuff. Um, but, you know, people saw Kenneth's talk. There's all <coughs> kinds of interesting things that, that happen in, in package managers that are out of the ordinary. When we look at uh, package manager registries and the development that goes into package management, it's often not clear where the source of funding is behind the work that goes into the software that connects all of those ecosystems together. Do you have any ideas of ways to make package management, development, and maintenance more sustainable, aside from venture capital? I mean, that is one way, right? It's, it's, it's interesting. Wait, you said sustainable, though, right? Sustainable. So, no, <laughs> venture capital. Right. Yeah. So, no, the, the interesting question is uh, th there's really possibly two types of registries, some that are under the direct explicit or implicit control of a for-profit corporation. And I could name, for instance, Maven with Sonatype or NPMGS for Node in this domain, are the ones that are under the control of a community and typically a major foundation behind the community, like the case of Python or Ruby. Um, the, the, the thing, for instance, look at Python. Uh, we were two inches away to lose support entirely uh, for any stable maintainers when the lead maintainer lost his job uh, and his company was uh, helping, helping make, make pay the bill and that to the basis. So sustainability is a difficult thing. Um, the, the, the thing that's a problem is if you have for-profit entities into the equation, then the relation with the community is eventually a bit biased, to say the least. That's an interesting area uh, that I'm going to point back at Mike and <clears throat> I've turned towards the relationship that GitHub has with open source and especially where people use GitHub as the database or the registry where potentially kind of running on goodwill uh, as a marketing agent, is that a long term option for package managers? Uh, I don't know if it is a long-term option for <coughs> GitHub or package managers. That said, I maintain a package manager that does that, so <laughs> <laughs> kind of hope. So GitHub's principle in general has been we don't really care how you use GitHub as long as you're not like abusing it in such a way that it adversely affects other people. So then you start to get down to weird things like how do you structure your Git repo? And if you have directories with 50,000 files in them, then that makes things very slow. And if you have you know, 50,000 directories in a nested hierarchy with one file in them, then that can actually be quite fast, and that's OK. So I think GitHub, I can't speak for GitHub, because although they don't pay me to talk about things like that. But uh, <laughs> yeah, in general, it's more or less a, as long as you're not causing us problems, it's fine. I think that's an interesting one in terms of, I guess what you touched upon, Philippe, uh, with for-profit and not, where for-profit companies are able to provide often these services which the community can rely on. And I think that's generally actually a pretty good thing. Although they may end up with a biased relationship with that community, then I think it still provides a, a rising tide of what the community can kind of expect to be provided. So before GitHub, a lot of us were spinning up our own, you know, if you want to get 
Git hosting before GitHub, <coughs> you were running your own server to provide that for you. But there and was a repository in Czechoslovakia at the time. Yeah, exactly. So there, there, was, there was various <laughs> I remember services. remember that. That's right. Oh, yeah. But essentially, essentially oh, that's easy. That's right, yeah. You're still always relying on someone else's yes, goodwill yeah, or yeah, money yeah. to pay for that. And I guess I would rather see that the money that's being spent on this stuff is coming from some organization which is still able to make a profit than the alternative, which is generally that that money is being paid for out of some open source maintainer's pocket or or even the donations of a community. I mean, uh, for me, I think the long-term viability would be solved by the very large companies, of which I would say GitHub is not actually one, but the very large tech companies that rely very heavily on a lot of these tools need to start paying back. Um, I, I can say that I've reached out, in Homebrew's case, and I'm not going to name them, to several large tech companies that swear blind that they don't use homebrew very much at all. But <laughs> Except there's hundred thousand dollar loads every day. <laughs> no, but exactly. But uh, we have our analytics like, which point I have your IP block dude. Like why Yeah, yeah come on. exactly. So so they will deny they will swear blind that they don't use that this stuff really. But then and they may well organizationally not think that they do. But it just so happens that ninety percent of their engineers do or whatever. And that's that's fine, but I think we need to figure out a way longer term that open source that is very wisely used by people to, bluntly, by people doing their jobs to make money, needs to not be built on the back of volunteers in their evenings and weekends, because it doesn't scale. Package managers seem to be one of the worst affected by the free rider problem. Yeah. So I... Yeah. So I was saying me. Go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. I'll, um, I'll go last. Well, I was going to say, I so... Different yeah, yes, I, I, I feel the, the free rider... What, what, what is the free rider you. problem? I, I don't subscribe to this being a problem. <sighs> okay, the free rider thing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can call it a pro it's, it's like an official commons. problem in economics. You can call it a. You can call it a problem. Are you talking about fallacy of the commons and things like that? Tragedy of the so commons. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so there's. I'm actually, and I'm I'm, I'm particularly curious. Uh, <laughs> so. For the last four or five months, I said before that, that like a registry is coming to go, and it is. Um, uh, I've been working with a few people, including folks at uh, JFrog, who do a lot of homebrew binary hosting. Um, uh, but so at least at the language package management level, right? Like from where I sit right now, it it feels kind of clean, and I feel like I can describe. Um, a system where people are well incentivized uh, for at least part of the set of expenses, right? Like the, the general problem of package management being underappreciated and despite the fact that literally everyone relies on it, nobody wants to pay for it, that's another thing. But registry hosting, like, you know, there's a subset of costs that we can focus on. So I've been working with folks from JFrog um, on trying to articulate what a registry for Go should look like. Um, and the expectation coming out of this, uh, and this this is actually something that I'm, I'm I'm hoping we'll have like a bunch of stuff to put out in public for discussion in the next month and a half or so. It's complicated by some other things that are happening. We'll see. But um, uh, I see what seems like a happy path, right? Where if we can define a specification for what a registry looks like, then that registry is the same whether it is public. Or private. Um, the the distinction between a public and private registry should not be at the level of the API in the way that you consume information from it. That doesn't make any sense. So, if uh, there is a certain amount of labor that goes into like let's define the standard, let's implement that, let's sort of have that, um, and let's maintain the standard over time. But once you have that, uh, it's it seems feasible, and in in this case, it's it's working out where. Uh, uh, JFrog has has you know suggested that it would be possible that like if we have a public Go registry that they might just host everything there for us right and they do most of it for well they hosted okay. Conan right like they they took on Conan and absorbed it into JFrog so they'd have a viable C plus plus package manager and that's basically like the a point. strategic decision right? exactly like so I think that's interesting there are companies which are which yeah. are well incentivized because when they work on providing 
the API that is consumed by the public, they have all of the infrastructure that they need in order to provide the same thing as a private service that they charge for two companies. It's, you know, configuration flippies, that's it. Uh, uh, so that, that specific part of this actually seems to work fairly well. Like, we shouldn't have to worry about bandwidth costs, we shouldn't have to worry about storage costs, all those things that come with actually, you know, the physical process of hosting this. There's still labor costs that come from the logic and management of the thing over time, but it feels to me like there is a reasonable economic model, at least for the hosting part of it, at least because this one company <laughs> exists. I mean, one company is not a general argument, but like, yeah, it, it, it seems reasonable to me that we could solve that part of it. So, in your question, that was <coughs> free riding on package managers or free riding on package, on managed package resources or free riding on the packaging of packages? I think he just means that the, he, the, how do you make sure that the project remains sustainable and well funded um, and, and that everyone isn't just using it for free when, you know, they, they, and, and getting value out of it without bothering to give back and maintain the core of the project? Right, but, so, so it, I mean, it would be sad if something like that died. No, no, I agree. Right. But so, in, in general, for free and open source software, uh, you absolutely must have a lot of free riders. Otherwise, you just don't exist. Free riders are the justifications for contributors to be willing to contribute because there's a lot of free riders to cater for. Um, at least that's my take. Yeah. So we have, uh, but you don't want yeah. only free riders, of course. You have the percentage. So I guess I'll, manage, right? I'll, yeah. I'll throw this out. Here's, here's another. I have a slightly different funding situation from. The other folks here, although I mean, we're not we're not a large corporation in, in any sense, right? Um, Just have a budget of how many billion dollars? <laughs> <laughs> but, but, that's, but not that's not okay. for my project, right? Okay, like, fair so, enough. Okay, fair so, enough, so, fair so, enough. So, so let's let's back up a second. So I, I work for the Department of Energy, ultimately, yeah, it's right? And, yeah. and one of the labs in it happens to be Lawrence Livermore. Yes, their budget is one point something billion a year, mm. um, but that's dedicated to like you know maintaining the nuclear stockpile. Okay. Um, and so, <laughs> not a package manager. You not, have like not a billion plus. Well, a year so manager? I'll get to that. So, <laughs> so the, and, and the and the DOE has lots of uh, alternative energy and, and all sorts of other missions that they do, and it all hinges on on supercomputing. And we have this big national exascale project right now, um, that you know the six big labs with supercomputing centers are participating in. Um, and, and so you know. I, in my experience, if you want to make something sustainable, then you need to, and then you need to make it critical for someone's mission, right? So that so that they will pay for it. And maybe that's a lot of people, maybe that's a few people. But in our case, um, we've been able to argue for SPAC um, just based on the adoption that it's gotten. And so, like, I have that plot in my in my presentation that says, you know, here's the lines of code in packages over time, and here's where they came from. Um, we're able to show, you know, that the, um, I mean, ultimately, our mission is to benefit the, the U.S. taxpayers. And if we can show that scientists are getting more work done efficiently because of SPAC, then people get people are very happy about that. And so if we can show charts like this that say, look, this is used at like all six national labs, um, or all six of the of the ones that are in the Exascale program, um, and that you know the the scientific software stack is being built with it, um, then we can make arguments like we should use SPAC to test that software stack as part of like the Exascale project. Um, and, and so on, and so like basically, like we, from from the start, I have striven to integrate it into things that are important in the organization. Like at Livermore, it's you know our major code teams. Is it benefiting them? At the DOE level, it's is it benefiting the Exascale project? And, and the more of that you can do, then the more funding you can get for things. And I think that that's paid off because I mean we are planning to do a, a big release plan for SPAC where we would do CI, we would have a release and a test engineer, and we'd have some funding at the different facilities to do package integration for the for the scientists there. So I mean, and, and then that can sustain the project, and we can make the argument based on the contributions that we get, and there are a lot of free riders mm -hmm. um, that we're getting more out than we put in. Like there, there are packages that our users at Livermore go to build that they can build because some random person on the internet put it in stack, and you know that's a, that's a big deal. Um, people actually appreciate that. So we've been able to make that case. Um, I think that's harder when you don't have like you know a large organization overarching the thing. But I, I do think this is one area where you know the DOE is very open to open source and, and very supportive of stuff like this. If you can show a direct line to benefit to the programs. And I think that's the thing. Is, I guess as we talked about free riders, it's, I, I think 
I agree that there has to be a certain number. Like it, it, that's essential. And I don't think anyone working on package management or any open source really begrudges, you know, an 18, 20 year old student who doesn't have a lot of money except for maybe a couple of beers at the weekend uh, to spend on software. Like I, I don't want to be receiving donations from those people. The, the sad thing is, those are the type of people who are giving donations. And the thing, the objection I have is when you have literally billion dollar corporations who are not being prepared to give like a dime to mm -hmm. open source projects that save them probably not to exaggerate millions of hours a year of their engineers time and I, I think for me that's the wider problem of how do we figure out how to the companies that are benefiting disproportionately from this stuff how do we convince them or make it easier for them to donate to these projects where when you look at something like a homebrew kickstarter or a homebrew patreon you know, most of the people who are donating there, frankly, I'm very glad they are, but frankly, they're the last people who should be because they're often people who aren't. They don't, they're not swimming in money and they're not, you know, getting as much benefit from homebrew as other people are. But yet, they're the ones who are generous and want to fund their infrastructure. So how do we figure out how we can make this? You not, know, and I think this applies to open source in general. How it, can we it doesn't out <coughs> how, how it doesn't rely on the generosity of <coughs> individuals and instead become something that becomes the generosity perhaps of wider society and government and yeah. corporations. It's, and stuff it's like that. actually not a problem with open source, it's a general problem. Um, I have a niece, I'm an old fart, so I have <laughs> nieces. I have a niece that uh, works for the Red Cross to solicit donations. And something she hates is going in the more posh neighborhoods because they give squat. And when she go in the less affluent neighborhoods and poorer neighborhoods, she receives tons of stuff. And, and so I, I think that's a fact. There's probably not much that can be done about here. But I don't think really it's a super problem unless you reach the point where the, the, the project no longer can sustain itself at all. And then you, 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 you basically have the issue of uh, uh, what happened to OpenSSL, and they got eventually funding for the work they do. And there's a few other projects that, that were in that situation where there were critical pieces of infrastructure that nobody knew or considered as being important because it was taken for granted uh, until until you realize actually there was really but nothing. But I think to it's important that. to be aware of that, right? Like, I mean, yeah, that, yeah. you wouldn't so, have seen that happen. Now, if, 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 if the OpenSSL developers, yeah. for instance, their case, were communicating about that and trying to be upfront or reaching out, and maybe they were, I, 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 I'm not privy to anything there. Uh, I think that's part of the responsibility of an open source software maintainer is to reach out to make sure you're known and appreciated. Uh, in, if anything, to attract community. And if anything, to be able to sustain yourself if you, as, a, as an author, disappears. Why don't you have blackout days for certain repos and say, ha ha? <laughs> so the thing is that how do you know that you have users? If, if you're a bona fide open source project and you don't have a, a central repository, uh, the only time you know you have a user is when there's a bug. I remember talking with someone a long time ago, uh, had built he was building ERP software, open source software, he says, and he was selling support services. And he was telling me, we've never had a better business when we're doing shitty releases. <laughs> because all of a sudden, users realized that everything was not for free, and then it would be a good idea to pay for some support. That is, that is one of the best ways to find the most interested parties in your software is to release something that's something broken, broken and they will pop up pretty quickly. I just want to point out a word that you both used, which was infrastructure. And infrastructure yes. in the package management world is much different to say OpenSSL. OpenSSL is an artifact that people pick up and use and deploy uh, as individual libraries, whereas package management is literally a service that runs mm. in the same way that water and electricity runs. But there seems to be very little respect in the, okay. especially the business world, that, that actually those registries are like electricity to their software projects. So this is the point that is this leads to a point that this is. I'll be careful about the way that I make this point. Um, 
so I would not analogize it to um, uh, to utilities necessarily. I think the more useful analogy um, is to uh, work that's done by humans that's frequently overlooked. Uh, so let's talk about you know the fact that. The meetings that happen between, I don't know, high-level lawyers or whomever actually have to get scheduled and organized by some group of people, right? And turns out, because we're computer people, we know that scheduling is a hard problem, like actual capital H hard problem. We have things called schedulers that do it because it's a hard fucking problem. Uh, and anyone who's actually looked at a calendar to try to figure out how to get 12 different people with ridiculously packed schedules together knows that it's a really hard problem. But it's not like we're crediting the people who are doing the work of organizing meetings with the success of the outcome of the meeting, literally ever. They're never even mentioned. They're not a part of it at all. They're just a part of the thing that has to happen in order to get to the interesting work. Like the first them organizer, for instance? <laughs> yeah. That's organizers of conferences. Yeah. Uh, people who yeah, work as, as receptionists. I mean, there's a whole class of invisible labor. And I think that, and you know, there's, there's a mirror of this that I, that I mentioned in my talk, right, which is that nobody ever wants package management problems. You don't wake up in the morning thinking, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to solve that conflict. That's what I'm going to do. That's going to be my morning. It's going to be great. I'm going to feel great. I'll have a great lunch after that. I That's not how things go. I do that. Yes, because, because saw, we're part I of that. Do, I, right. I sometimes do that. I know. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, you know, you're working on something else. <laughs> yes. It's, and then it's, package it's some management disorder. comes up. Like, it's, it's the incidental thing, right? So there is this, this, this connects with uh, the idea of gendered work and then even gets into emotional labor. Like, there's a whole giant pile of, of uh, understanding of when certain classes of work get ignored. So one of the reasons why, I was kind of discussing this after my, after my talk earlier, um, one of the reasons that I think it is important to try to surface package management as a problem domain that is uh, analogous to compilers. I always compare to compilers it's for many reasons. But like, I, I think that's important, and I have been trying to figure out the ways to like, get academics interested in stuff like that, is because <laughs> we have to come out of the shadows by having some sort of like, oh, this is actually like interesting to people who work on things. This is not just a prerequisite. Have you, have you thought about publishing papers? Yes, and I've talked to academics about it. Right. We, I mean, having done that, like I would, that is a way to do it. Yes. That is when we yes. got our contributions up. And there so are, is, yeah, exactly, yeah. right. And there, there are papers in Popple right now, which are, are I've been pointed towards to say, like, hey, this is a, you know, a, a yeah, place to pull on from there. Papers from Lisa and yeah. Nick's and, yeah, lots of things. Right. No, there's, there's, there's venues for it. But yeah. the point is that we, we, have, we have been sort of what feels like a rounding error or an after effect uh, for a long time <laughs> in, in, the space of actually building software because we're just the tool that gets you to the thing that, that, you, that you care about. We're never the things you actually care about unless you're hmm. doing the work. So to be fair, I, I think that's, that's, yeah, for the academic side of things, I think there's a whole lot of really interesting problems in package management that need to be formalized and mm -hmm. written down, and there's not that much of that out there. No. Nope. So, you know, if, if that, that's one way to get academic psyched about it, but I don't think that solves your sustainability problem. No, that, that was one. Yeah. Little thing. Yes. I have, I have a quick question about that because uh, as a, an academic and as a maintainer of package manager, like I know, right? Uh, I uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, we've tried. Like in our in our team, like we have other academics, we, we tried to publish, and and we got rejections that yeah. says like this is a very nice paper, but this is not the venue, and we, and the, and the reviewers say, unfortunately, I don't know where else to suggest that you guys send the, the paper. Want to start a journal? Yeah. Package management. No, <laughs> yeah, we're organizing a workshop at Supercomputing. This, this Publish November. it at FOSDEM. Yeah. But push, push it to ArcSiv. Go out of the, the beaten path, the, the, the over the beaten path. Put a talk at FOSDEM or in a tech conference. Publish a paper at the same yeah. time. And that creates some awareness. And maybe you will not get the exact peer recognition that you crave for. Uh, but it will still probably be very useful. But, but yeah, yeah, it's better than a rejected paper in any case. And the other thing peer, that, peer recognition isn't paying bills, though. Which, no, yeah, that's true. Yeah, we're, we're yeah, yeah, deviated that's true. from paying yeah, bills. For I, academics, I, that yeah. doesn't work. And like I actually that. like, I, I've been thinking for a while about, as you said yourself, um, about ways that potentially you could have 
a perhaps a gray out instead of a black out. Brown out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like to, to demonstrate that, you know, not I again when I get very grumpy about homebrew stuff sometimes I, I debate about just turning it off for a day and then <laughs> letting people see and then be like, okay, well maybe you can pay for this then. But a, a way I could think of of doing that perhaps slightly more diplomatically would be a little message that pops up if you're on a particular large corporation's IP range, for Maybe example. with Jimmy Wales' face. <laughs> exactly. Have you thought about donating to Homebrew? Yeah, or, or even just little <laughs> things like perhaps red you, you, you don't get access to binary packages. So that means that you still get software that works, but it ends up wasting a bunch of your time generating essentially the same software that you could have downloaded. Yeah. We won't give that stuff that you can download to you. Because again, it's interesting that JFrog and was mentioned earlier. So yeah. Bintray is the main Homebrew package host. And they are providing essentially for free, like, terabytes of downloads a month to homebrew users. And that's great. Again, I think, I, and I'm sure they don't begrudge doing that, and I'm sure they particularly don't begrudge doing that to students. I, I wouldn't be surprised if people in Bintray slightly begrudge doing that to corporations that have a market cap 100, 1,000, you know, 100,000 times the size of them. You know, who are effectively again freeloading off yeah. the you charitable donations. Fastly sat across almost every package manager. Right? Fastly are donating so many yeah. gigabytes of bandwidth every day to almost every large package manager. It's going through them without paying. They donate all of that bandwidth for free. If they decided not to do that, or their VC funding runs out and they actually have to make a profit, they turn all of those off. And Python had this, uh, oh no, Read the Docs had this with essentially the host saying, and I think it was accidental, but like, we're not going to provide free hosting to you anymore. They would have been straight out of business and the whole service would have been shut down. So isn't there a problem to have centralized monolithic registry, uh, a problem that creates this kind of situations? Yeah, so you're focusing the attention. If you're focusing on one IP, one domain, one host. Sam just sat there smiling like, yeah, we don't uh, have that. Because that's, no, a, that's no. a problem Go doesn't have. Except that's we a do. Problem GitHub is our single point of failure. Who's, like, yeah. come on, yeah. seriously. Okay, okay. They could do US every once in a while. Uh, Composer tries to do a bit the same for PHP and, and, and doesn't have a central registry per se. I mean, there is. It's more like a, a catalog, yeah. But it's not really a registry. No, right. It's it's yeah. It, it, but it just refers right back to GitHub. They don't actually host anything themselves. Yeah. Um, okay. I mean, so is the problem GitHub? <laughs> it's not a problem so far. The, it the, could. It could become a problem. It's not a problem. Like of course there's a problem with single points of failure. But the choice here is not between single point of failure and perfect distributed everything on IPFS. You know, responsibility yeah. evenly distributed across the world. The choice is between uh, um, single point of failure and nope. That's yeah. the choice, like realistically, um, yeah. and uh, you know there are there there are a lot of windmills that I have tilted at in my life, but this is not one that I choose to tilt at anymore. Like, you know, you you find a company like Fastly, yes, like they're 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 probably not going to turn off their support anytime soon. There are you know uh, um, there are enough forces at work there that it will probably at least keep them socially at bay if they were to like turn off support for read the docs. Uh, if Fastly goes under, there are other CDNs. Like you know th that they represent a significant portion of handling traffic on the internet. But I'm not saying it's great. I'm just saying in the in the set of options that we have. I'm okay with focusing on other things rather than reducing SPOF there. I think you got to get a set of core people focused on making sure that you know they have a next source of funding if something goes wrong. But I mean, I, I don't think they have to. If I mean, as long as the governance is sustainable, right? What you really worry about question, is like if yes, there's the one person yes. maintaining the project and they get burnt out. Right. That is. And, and I think that's a much more severe concern mm -hmm. than that you have all the resources that you need. Because I think if you have a group of people who really care about the project, then they will continue to, to push and find yeah. avenues for, for funding it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we got five minutes. Uh, I, so I, I, I just know that uh, uh, central registry does not equal one hosting, one domain, or one IP address. That's true. It's to play orthogonal. Uh, and uh, it uh, works very well uh, in, I think, most, most all, all the distributions that have uh, so-called mirrors. There's still something like a registry, some file that <coughs> describes all packages available, and it's uh, replicated to many, many, many servers uh, around the world. So there's a question at the back. Uh, yeah, I just, um, I wonder about 
So the relationship with like something like JFrog, right, where if Go package registry is going to rely on JFrog, the popularity of Go as it increases, JFrog is going to have increased revenue from enterprise deployments of this package registry, mm -hmm. which means their revenue goes up. But if that revenue doesn't somehow translate back to the Go project, the popularity also means that the number of issues and other traffic that you have to deal with on the Go project is also increasing. And that seems like a fundamental imbalance there. Like it, it feels like that has to translate back somehow, because that's, that's the greatest one-way street that I see. We've seen that a lot in the NPM world. Like, the NPM client is open source, and they cannot keep up with the level of activity. The amount of bugs reported is nowhere near. And NPM has probably is one of the registries with the most resources behind it to be able to solve problems, and they can't employ enough people to keep up with the amount of users despite this ridiculous growth. Where does it end, or should we have smaller, more smaller things that are, rather than massive registries, try and break those things out? Is there a way of avoiding that spiraling cycle of, uh, of increased growth? I think part of that is that we've, I think we've got bad in the last five or ten years at um, mixing support requests with issues. So, true. I mean, certainly when I, like, I did my Google Summer of Code on KDE 10 years ago, and that's where I kind of cut my teeth in open source. And there was no expectation that if you as a user couldn't work out how to do something in Kmail, that it was a reasonable thing for you to do to file a bug on the KDE Bugzilla and then expect the Kmail maintainer to tell you how to use Kmail. Like, whereas the wider open source ecosystem now, it does appear that most projects have begrudgingly accepted that if someone can't work out how to use your stuff, that's on you to like walk them through the process. Hey, and I've happily accepted that. No, and not that, begrudgingly happily. Yeah, Come no. On. So, and, and there's people who like that. To be fair, like <laughs> that, that's fine. But like that, that really doesn't scale. Like, and that's and there's a lot so of open true. source projects <laughs> that that I, I see people being crushed by the weight of their own like, benevolence, frankly. Where yeah. like you, yep. one of the things with homebrew that. I guess I've realized eventually is that it's it's not effective for me to walk someone through who is literally using the terminal for the first time how to type their password into sudo because it doesn't show the stars that they're used to in a GUI. Like literally this happens monthly, but that's not a good use of my time because if I spend an hour helping that person, that's an hour I'm not fixing bugs that affect 10,000 or 100,000 other people. So now, I'll, I think that's the, the tricky balance that we're having to get to as well. That I, I think, personally, a lot of projects overcommit in terms of they expect, they provide an expectation to their users that they're going to help them with any problem they have, rather than an expectation to the users that if you can provide a reproducible test case that, work, that I can apply on my machine and reproduce as a bug, I will commit to trying to fix that at some point. Like that, to me, is a, a more realistic expectation. It stops people burning out. But this isn't a popular opinion, so I it, it, No, no, it's, it's popular. It makes a lot of sense. Now, it's, it's probably just a matter of which stage uh, package manager tool or not in terms of maturity you are. At the beginning, it probably makes sense to say, <laughs> I'll do anything for you because I want you to use my tool. Mm -hmm. As you grow, uh, you have two cases. Either you were successful to growing also not only a base of users, but a few contributors. And you should delegate these, or find a way to delegate these more mundane questions to new and aspiring contributors. Or because otherwise, you, you're going to get crushed and, and, yeah. and burned yeah. out pretty quickly. Or just, I mean, one of the best or ways feel bad, which is not a good thing. Neither friend of One of the best ways to do that is to just leave it. Like, I've, I've yeah. found that actually, like, if you, I mean, inadvertently found, kind of. So, I, mean, I, had, I had a baby, and I was like, what's going to happen? Like, oh, no, I'm not there. I have to, to respond to issues. And then, you know, people stepped in and said, hey, you know, we're going to we're gonna take over and, and help out with these issues. And I think focusing on growing your community and focusing on your contributors like the Humber guys do is, is the right way to go, because then you will have people who can who can kind of fill in for, for things like that. And if some issues get left, which, which they will, then, I mean, I did, at some point, there's not much you can do about that. So, I mean, it, it might be interesting for GitHub to have some kind of metric that says, you know, it, it doesn't look at the amount of open issues as, 
you know, a bad thing, but as a metric of how much support does this project need? Opportunity, right? Yeah, yeah. you know, how much, how much are they able to meet demand for these services? Okay, so we're, yeah. we're getting to the end of it. Just to run around the panel quickly and get an idea of where they think or would like the future of package management to go. Uh, it doesn't have to include the sustainability discussion, but just as a kind of a nice closing note, something slightly more <coughs> positive, maybe. <laughs> uh, I have my answer. Uh, I, I really want to define some sort of... Uh, for language package managers, it doesn't have to be a universal tool, but I want universal standards for describing what the actual contents are in a way that we can emit from either package managers or from running programs so that we can teach containers to actually read that information and container runtimes can report the actual full stack of uh, 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 software that they are running so that you can construct larger systems which are able to introspect containers to tell you the entire set of all of the versions of all the things that you have for all of your containers and all of your infrastructure. Because Google actually has something more or less like that and it's really great. Um, and this entire cloud native thing that we're doing right now is garbage pants as long as our <laughs> like containers or black boxes of what's running here. I don't know. Look at the Docker file. That's terrible. It's not okay. Um, but there's already a bunch of really interesting stuff around this and, and that's something that would have to you know be a sort of cross language package manager effort to make a standard around that. But I think we can do it. So he stole my thunder, basically. <laughs> Pearl's a part of that. It would be, yeah. I mean no, yeah. so so having a common manifest format Eventually, going as far as having a package manager construction kit, such that when there's a new language that pops up, and that's great, there's a new language that pops up. They don't reinvent the wheel all over again. Uh, everybody wants to write its package manager in its own language. That kind of makes sense. Uh, coming with a few convention standards uh, approaches, such that effectively you have. Uh, manifest that makes sense, then their data attributes schema align more or less. Uh, the way they resolve dependencies aligns more or less would go a very, very long way. So, yeah, I think I'm, I'm on kind of the same page. Um, I, I would like something that... <laughs> you will have nothing to say anymore. <laughs> like, well, okay, I want it for a different reason, though. So, no, like, no, you, no, you okay. want to introspect containers, I want to introspect the system package manager and get enough information out of it to know what stuff is installed there that I can actually depend on. Because it, it seems like, honestly, that's what people want. They like Homebrew, mm -hmm. and, the, you know, the, the Homebrew has a different kind of maintenance situation than Spac in that, like, they, they maintain things for Mac OS, and they can assume that the Mac OS things are there. Whereas we're trying to run cross-platform, and so in our model, we have to abstract all the system dependencies, and you have to register them explicitly if you want to depend on them. I want enough metadata to make it reliable to build against them. So um, that and, and then enough metadata to work with another package manager at the language level. So like, for example, I don't want to re-implement NPM. Yeah. I don't want to have anything to do with the JavaScript ecosystem in terms of managing its packages. Yep. That is already done. People know how to do that. Yeah. Um, but I would like to fetch them, archive them, install them, put them in other yeah. environments, yeah. Um, and be able to work with them in, in, in like a system context. And currently, there isn't, you know, I don't see a good way to do that. And, so, and the same for Java, yeah. for Composer, for yeah, VNLs. And, and, and I've whatever. written, I've yeah. written parsers for H and every of these. So did Andrew, and that's that's freaking stupid. <laughs> yeah. 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 If we got multiple package managers, but we've got multiple parsers of those package managers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and a clean way to override, I guess, I would say. Yeah. Like, so that if, if I, like, so mm. I want to pip install most things for Python, if they're pure Python, fine. But if it's NumPy, I really want to control the libraries. I want to optimize them. So mm. I want to be able to plug into that. So I'd, and I don't know what that looks like, but I think if, if you could have that level of communication between the different package managers, that would be good. Right. Yeah, so one part, much the same, more collaboration between package managers, language ones, system ones, all that type of thing. I think we, we end up doing a lot of work in each of the package managers which we could share a lot more than we do. And the other thing just being more financial resources for package managers in general. Nice. Can, can I add something? 
Yeah. If we could get rid of uh, all operating system except Linux, that would make the life much easier. <laughs> <laughs> that would make my life much easier. <laughs> that would make my life much easier. In and all the processors except for Haswell, and then you know we would yeah. be in, we'd be in a great shape. <laughs> all the GPUs except for one. Cut to mention. What could go wrong? Why not? Yeah. So I just want to thank all the panelists today and all the speakers we've had. It's been amazing to have the first package manager room here. Hopefully we come back next year, maybe with a slightly larger room. Uh, and hopefully this spurs on a lot of conversation around working together, trying to standardize on some language, even if that doesn't mean any more than, uh, than just a shared knowledge base of all of the bear traps that you can step in whilst building a package manager would be uh, a really good way of ensuring that we continue to build upwards rather than just keep building around each other. Uh, ben, do you mind coming here for a second? Yeah. Maybe if everybody can give a round of applause to the organizers, Ben, ben and Andrew, and yeah. Andrew, who took the <laughs> time to organize this. And I think that's everything for today. Thanks so much. Thanks so much.